Welcome everyone for joining us today. This is Barbara Van Allen, president of the club, and we are going to get started in exactly one minute. Good morning, and welcome to the 575th meeting of the Economic Club of New York in our 113th year. I'm Mike O'Neill, vice chair of the club. The Economic Club of New York is one of the nation's leading forums for discussion on economic, social, and political issues. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our healthcare workers, our frontline workers, and all those in public positions that make our lives safer and easier during this difficult time. Our club's mission is as important today as ever, as we continue to bring people together as a catalyst for conversation and innovation. Particularly during these challenging times, we proudly stand with all communities seeking inclusion and mutual understanding. Put these words into action, the club kicked off its focus on racial equity series, where we have been leveraging our platform to bring together prominent thought leaders to help us explore and better understand the various dimensions of racial inequity and to highlight strategies, best practices, and resources that the business community can use to be a force for change. We will be cataloging, publishing, and sharing these insights broadly. We're not doing this work alone, and I'd like to give special thanks to our corporate partners, Bloomberg, MasterCard, PayPal, Taconic Capital, and S&P Global, as well as the many members, speakers, and subject matter experts that are now and will be engaged in this work. I'd like to take a moment to recognize those of our 316 members mm -hmm. of the Centennial Society attending today, as their contributions continue to be the financial backbone of support for the club and help enable us to offer our programming now and in the future. A special welcome to members of the Economic Club of New York 2020 Class of Fellows, a select and very diverse group of rising next generation thought leaders. Please make a special note that applications for the 2021 class are now open. Any member interested in nominating a fellow can visit our website for more details. We'd also like to welcome students from Rutgers University Gabelli School of Business at Fordham University and the Medgar Evers School of Business. It's an honor for me now to welcome our special guest today, Chairman and Managing Director of General Catalyst, Kenneth Chenault. As a Managing Director of the firm, Ken focuses on investing in fast growing companies that have the potential to become large fundamental institutions. He also provides guidance to portfolio companies, particularly to those with an eye toward global markets and responsible innovation as they scale their teams and products. <clears throat> as chairman, Ken leverages his renowned leadership abilities and experience to continue to evolve General Catalyst into a formidable and enduring firm. Prior to joining General Catalyst, Ken was chairman and chief executive officer of American Express Company, a position he held from 2001 to 2018. Under his leadership, American Express built one of the world's largest customer loyalty programs, Membership Rewards, and earned global recognition as a leader in customer service. Ken is recognized as one of the business world's experts on brands and brand management. He's been honored by multiple publications, including Fortune Magazine, which named him as one of the world's 50 greatest leaders in its inaugural list in 2014. Ken serves on the boards of Airbnb, Berkshire Hathaway, Chief, Guild Education, Harvard Corporation, and the NCAA. In addition, he is on the boards of numerous nonprofit organizations, including the Smithsonian Institution's Advisory Council for the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National September 11th Memorial and Museum at the World Trade Center, Bloomberg Philanthropies, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Human Centered Artificial Intelligence Institution Advisory Council at Stanford University. The format today will be a conversation in which we are fortunate to have Economic Club in New York Chair Emerita and Senior Fellow at the Hudson Institute, Nagy Jose Kravis, doing the honors. We'll end promptly at 11.45 and any questions that were sent to the club from members in advance were shared with Nagy Jose. As a reminder, this conversation is on the record and we do have media on the line. Over to you, Nagy Jose. Thank you, Mike, and thank you Ken for agreeing to uh, share your time with us this morning. Um, this is really our year end conversation and it's been quite a year um, with COVID of course uh, being the dominant issue but also 
uh, race relations as we witnessed the murder of George Floyd, uh, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, and, um, and so many other acts of violence. And Ken, um, you have said that uh, race was one of the obstacles that you couldn't overcome. And I wonder if you'd share with us uh, some of your experiences uh, in dealing with uh, racial injustice. Yeah, I think what's important, Marie Jose, and first let me say I'm very glad to be uh, with the Economic Club of New York. And Mike, thank you for those kind words. Race certainly is, is America's greatest unsolved problem. And for me, let me get a little bit personal. Uh, I was born uh, three years before the landmark Supreme Court decision of Brown v. Board of Education, striking down separate but equal. And um, a good friend of mine, uh, Ted Wells, who is an outstanding litigator at Paul Weiss, we refer to ourselves as Brown babies because without Brown v. Board of Education, uh, it would have been very difficult for us to be afforded some of the opportunities but it's also a reminder of how far we have come. And I think what is very important is that race has an impact on my life almost every day. So I think what's important for people to understand is in my daily interactions, I'm reminded that I'm black. And in many cases, those are not positive reminders. But Could I you think- give us a few examples maybe? Or, I mean, do you mind giving sure. us one or two examples? Of sure. You know, I think, you know, growing up, uh, Marie Jose, what was important is my parents instilled in me a pride for, for being Black, but they also instilled in me an understanding that I was going to have to fight for my rights, and I had obstacles that I had to overcome. Uh, so in, in school, um, uh, sometimes I was met with racial epithets, uh, that were cast out on the playing field. Um, someone uh, rubbing my head because my hair was different. Uh, someone, uh, people saying, um, you're brown, so you're dirty. Uh, and that was just something you, you had to deal with and adjust to. Uh, and what I think is important is I led a black middle-class life. My father was a dentist. My mother was a dental hygienist. They, they put a high premium on education, but I saw clearly whether it was going into a store and being followed or even as CEO, when I sometimes went to a restaurant uh, and I was going with a colleague and someone may have called ahead to say the CEO of American Express is gonna be at the restaurant, they would invariably look at my white colleague uh, assuming that they were the CEO of, of the company. And then I'll just give you one incident because it, it happens in all different ways. As I remember my, towards the end of my second year, beginning first year at uh, American Express and, and, and overall, obviously I had a very good set of experiences there but I remember a peer of mine who had not met me. We were at Harvard Business School at a, at a recruiting event. And he said, 
it's incredible to meet you. And I said, why are you saying that? He said, well, the way people talk about you, I could not have imagined that you were black. And obviously I responded in a very direct, angry manner, manner to him. But I, I say that again to emphasize what we call the black tax that uh, mm -hmm. is, is fairly significant and it's an overhang that's important because what you're fighting for is to have a clear-eyed perspective and not be pulled down by these acts of bias. So what were the influ main influences on you growing up that helped you deal with all these slights and, and this prejudice? Besides, yeah, well, I mean, I know you mentioned your parents, but were there other influences that helped you navigate through this? Yeah, I think I'll go through sort of a range of influences. One is, I believe I was very fortunate to grow up at the height of the civil rights movement. And mm -hmm. as a young person, uh, fortunately, I loved to read. And um, at a very, probably at seven or eight years old, I really uh, wanted to understand why racism existed, why it happened, how to overcome it. And so following civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King uh, was very important to me. Uh, in high school, Malcolm X was someone that uh, I, I saw as a person who was able to overcome incredible obstacles. And then also I started to follow Nelson Mandela and, uh, and Nelson Mandela is an incredible hero uh, to me um, because he was able to overcome 27 years of being in prison and yet thriving. And um, so I, so my mentors, frankly, I was someone who enjoyed school, was pretty good at sports. So I had mentors of my coaches. I had some incredible teachers. So mm -hmm. I had a teacher uh, who I still stayed close to until she passed away several years ago who literally followed me through first grade through eighth grade. Wow. And um, uh, was absolutely terrific. And then I had uh, the headmaster of the school that I went to uh, was incredibly supportive. And then I had a range of teachers, both black and white, who, who were absolutely instrumental. And and I think in, in business, I've been very, very fortunate uh, to have a range of leaders, both inside and outside American Express, Harvey Golub, Lou Gerstner, Jim Robinson, uh, Vernon Jordan, who was on the board of American Express, uh, was a very strong influence, Franklin Thomas, so I've been very, very fortunate to have a range of people, both in business, outside of business, who were able to give me real guidance and support. So you speak of business and, you know, there's been so much discussion in the past few months uh, about the need for business to recruit, to mentor, to train, to hold on to a more diverse workforce. Do you think it's different this time? I mean, do you really think that uh, we've heard this oftentimes and then, you know, they check a few boxes and life goes back to what it is. Do you think this time it's different? Uh, I'm cautiously, and I'll underline cautiously optimistic for a variety of reasons. 
I think obviously the events of this summer with the murder of George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery and Breonna Taylor and so many others, I do think that there is a reassessment that is going on. And what has been very challenging in America, and that's why I, I think we've got to keep the dialogue going, is that in America, we're very uncomfortable talking about race and the issues involving race. And one of the things that I think has to happen in all types of forums is we've got to talk about the issues of racism, systemic racism. We have to raise people, people's awareness. But I think what is also critical is focusing on the actions that we're going to take and that the actions have to be long-term. And one of the things I say to people and CEOs is one of the first things that you need to do is you need to talk to your organization on how you think about race. What are the learnings? What are the issues that you've had to deal with? What are some of the changes that you're gonna bring about? What are the individual actions? What happens when you're having a conversation with people and statements are made that clearly are biased? As you examine your personal life and business life, what did you do about it? Because if you simply brushed it off, then you're not dealing with the issue. You're not being proactive. And if you're not challenging the status quo, I think you become complicit. You know, one, um, one example, um, if I could just give it that, I think sure. is a powerful one that Ken Frazier, the CEO of Merck, who's a close friend, cites is Roy Vagelos, mm -hmm. who is, was one of the all-time great CEOs. And Ken was a lawyer who uh, was doing some work for Merck, came to see Ken and said to him, my top colleagues who are all white have had difficulty and tell me that it's very hard to find people, black people and put them in the pipeline. I want you to come to Merck and I'm gonna be your mentor. You've gotta take personal accountability. And so it's both taking the action as well as putting, putting in the processes and making sure you execute. So, I mean, that's a, that's a fabulous example. And I know that you and Ken Fraser and others are working also at, at, at trying to uh, develop more momentum for CEOs hiring a more diverse workforce. But you speak to a lot of CEOs and I just wonder, is this a reaction to, outrage, to you know, outrageous actions and violence? Or do you think that they really understand that diversity makes a corporation stronger and richer? I think some do <laughs> and some don't. Uh, I am heartened. I really am heartened, Marie Jose, by the conversations I've had uh, over the summer. And I think there are a number of CEOs who have seen the impact of having a more diverse workforce and the benefits to their business and company overall. But what is absolutely critical is they have to face this issue as they would any challenging business issue. How are they gonna innovate? What are the tactics that they need to put in place? 
how are they going to measure? How are they going to hold people accountable? It's got to be integrated into the entire fabric of the company. So tell me, we often hear about the, we hear, and you mentioned it, the, the word pipeline. Is that a real issue or is that a cop out? It's a maybe a little of both. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of both. The, the reality is one of the things I say to people who say I have a pipeline issue, one of the things I say is, well, how long have you been in charge? Because you're the one who controls what's put into the pipeline. And so the reality is that, um, again, if you simply take the position that the status quo approach and processes are the ones that you're going to follow, then you're not going to make progress. And my experience has been that if you understand how to go after the source of talent and you vary your approaches, that you can make substantial progress on the pipeline issue. Now, there's some areas where there, there are issues of supply, uh, but I think there are many areas where clearly the talent is there. And I also, one of the things I talk about is what I call the handful strategy, which is in some areas, getting a few diverse people in position, what you see over time is that leads to an increase more broadly in diversity across the company. Well, speaking of someone who questioned the, the status quo, uh, you were the CEO of American Express, one of the world's best known brands. Um, and you really led the transformation uh, from a payments company or a card company to a platform company. And could you tell us about what, what informs you about change elements? Sure. I, I think what's very important about bringing about change in a company <laughs> is... First, you need to understand what's at the core of the company because that will help guide you in the transformation that you need to bring about. For American Express, at the core of the company was service. And American Express is now a 170-year-old company, started off as a freight forwarding company. What does that have to do with payments? But at the core was this commitment to service. And so my view was that American Express had always been a platform. And that platform delivered services. Second point that I think is critical in a transformation is you can't get wet wedded to any business or form factor. Mm -hmm. And so what was important is that American Express has an incredibly successful payment business and a card business. But one of the points that I emphasize for the company is that the card was a form factor and it was only a platform to deliver services. And that platform was evolving. That was very important in, with the digital transformation and the move to virtual payments that people did not focus on this piece of plastic alone because my view was this piece of plastic could go away and we shouldn't be wedded to the form factor. 
The third point that I would make is it's very important that you're constantly focused on how to drive growth and you're also setting the appropriate metrics. So one of the points that I felt very strongly about was that American Express needed to capture a greater share of their card member spending, but also historically, American Express had been over dependent on travel and entertainment spending. And if we look at the whole customer, in addition to their t and spending, they had a very large opportunity in personal spending. So one of the things that I'm most proud about is that we took American Express from a company that on spending, 70% of the spending was T&E. And we still maintained a strong position in T&E, but we changed our share in the company to 70% non-T&E and 30% T&E. And I think that was very important because we took a holistic approach to understanding that we needed to meet the spending needs of all of our customers. While you were doing this, you were confronted with uh, the bursting of the dot-com bubble at the end of the 90s and then the financial crisis <clears throat> in 2000, 2008-2009. What are the lessons that you learned from these, uh, from, lead, from leading in a crisis? What are the tips that you would share with other leaders? Well, the way I start off is um, my leadership mantra that literally I think about every day is the role of a leader is to define reality and give hope. And mm -hmm. defining reality, as we all know, is very, very difficult. Uh, and it's not enough then to do the situational analysis. It's what are the tactics and strategies that will give you hope? <clears throat> so in the financial crisis, like everyone, uh, American Express was impacted very substantially. And what I think is important is you've got to give people that sense of reality. And so for, for me, I developed a mantra, which was stay liquid. If you think about mm -hmm. the environment, then that was really critical and explain to 60,000 plus employees, the importance of staying liquid. I also said, here are the reasons why I believe we can stay profitable. And then the third point was, we're gonna selectively invest in growth. And so one of the things I've learned in a crisis, whether it was 9-11 or the financial crisis is one that you've got to give people a sense that you get it, you, that you understand the challenges that you're confronting. You may not have all the answers of how you're going to meet those challenges, but also that you're giving them some focus. And what was very important was to give people some signposts that they could track. So one of the things that I said to people as a signpost is we should look to see if we're gonna have a trade down from our premium products to lower price products. That's a very important health of the franchise signpost. Fortunately, we did not see that. That was, that was absolutely critical. 
Second thing that I said to people was, we're going to, we need to be very focused on retention of our customers. And so we saw very good retention there. The other point back to selectively investing is we identified several areas. One was we wanted to get more involved in commercial payments, B2B payments. And we said, we're gonna invest and here's where we're gonna invest. That gave the organization some hope. So I think in a crisis, you clearly want to define the situation you're in. You want to give people a sense of what your objectives are in that crisis. You want to give them some signposts. You've obviously got to demonstrate a great sense of urgency. And I think you want to be empathetic, but also very decisive. And that's where some leaders get things confused that they look at being empathetic, that you're being soft, and then they defer making the difficult decisions. You've got to be very forceful and decisive, but you also have to be very empathetic because you need to have the hearts and minds of your people. So, and do you think that this applies to, for example, the current situation of a pandemic where the virus almost is telling the story and you have in a way less control over some of the parameters. Do you think that this, this similar approach to leadership applies in a pandemic, for example? Yeah, so let me contrast it. What I would say very frankly, and I've said this to a number of CEOs who've called me for advice, you take 9-11, uh, you take the financial crisis, times 10 is the pandemic. So this is, a, this is a crisis that is unimaginable. That said, what I think I've seen a number of CEOs do, which is important, is first to emphasize the safety and security of their people. I think that was very important. I think what's critical for the pandemic is the level of communication has to be constant. So you're setting the context. And I see a number of companies who have been able to set a pretty good context and communicate some of the uncertainty as well as here's what we know and here's what we're going to do. And here are some of the signposts. What is also happening is I think some companies are certainly making investments in growth. And, and I think it's fair to say we feel very different than we felt in March, mm -hmm. uh, where people thought the bottom was falling out. By no means do people think it's smooth sailing at all? I think we all understand it's going to be very, very challenging. But I think that the communication about remote working is important. The fact that those who are deciding to have partial return to the office are emphasizing the safety protocols that they're putting in place and ensuring people of their safety. And I think that is absolutely critical. But I do think that the lessons for me from the financial crisis and 9-11 is you've got to be very clear with people how you're navigating through the crisis day to day. But also you have to give them a sense of what the business priorities are and the capabilities in the company to meet those priorities. Now you've said that maybe one of the most common mistakes that CEOs make, and you've said that that was your experience also, is not moving quickly enough. Yeah, I, you know, one of the 
Yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, um, it's, it's important in a range of areas. Um, and let me be clear, I think you've got to be thoughtful. But what I have seen is sometimes people take too long to move on poor performers in an organization and the damage that that poor performer uh, can inflict on the organization is very substantial. And so when you know someone is not performing, you've got to move quickly. You've got to do it in a respectful way, but you got to move quickly. I think that Sometimes some people spend too much time on the analysis and getting it all perfect when 60, 70% will do uh, and you move forward. And so I've always had a bias to action, but to be thoughtful and to be guided by the principles and criteria that I've set. So for me, one of the things that I always focus on for the company for American Express that I evaluated a lot of our actions was one, what were we doing to provide superior value to customers and clients? How did we set that up? How did we measure it? How did we deliver best in class economics? And then because we are a American Express was a brand driven company. Everything we do must support and enhance the brand. So when you move, you got to have a rationale. You got to have a criteria, but speed is very important. So you're now, um, you're now advising and helping a number of, uh, a number of startups and do they get it? I mean, do you think that they get it? The the importance of value, the soul of the company, the long-term commitment, speed, scale, yeah, is it, I would is say, it a different mentality? Yeah, I think, Marie Jose, what I, um, one of the reasons why I'm real excited to be doing what I'm doing uh, is. And by the way, you're not, it's quite a heavy retirement. Yeah, <laughs> I'm enjoying it. I call it the next chapter, not retirement, but the next chapter. But one of the things that I've been very excited <laughs> about, it, and one of the reasons why. I, I went to General Catalyst is our, our mission, which I was involved in crafting, is to invest in powerful, positive change that endures. So I really believe that whether you're a startup uh, or a company 170 years old, you want to endure. And I found that message is resonating with founders. And I, what I really enjoy is the opportunity to work with founders. And that's what I'm finding who are very mission driven and want to understand how to build a company that will endure. It doesn't mean the company will never be sold, but it shouldn't be. I want to build this company because in three years, I'm going to take it public and then I don't care what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that I'm a real proponent for companies and companies in technology to be very focused on what I call responsible innovation. So um, there is one company that's less, less known maybe in which you become quite involved, but I find quite interesting called the Guild. Right. Um, because they've been very, very active in um, workforce training, which is one of the areas where I think government programs have not been as successful. And right. I wonder if you might just tell us in a few words what the Guild is, what they do and, and why you were so attracted to that company. So first of all, let me just say that I think to your point, Marie Jose, I believe very strongly that workforce education in America needs to be transformed. I think we all know the importance 
of people having jobs, but people also being able to have upward mobility in those jobs. And Guild was uh, founded by a person by the name of Rachel Carlson, who's 30 years old, who since she was 13, had a passion for workforce education. Uh, as I told Rachel when I met her, that was not my passion at 13 years old, but I <laughs> admire her greatly and she's a very well-rounded person. But she is really uh, focused on all aspects. Initially started the forerunner of Guild as a not-for-profit and then put together a, realized she could have more of an impact, get more scale um, as a for-profit company. And so she's created a marketplace platform that meets the needs of employees, of corporations, of universities, of trade schools. And so the way Guild operates is they have done an incredible analysis from a price value standpoint of educational institutions that come into the network. They also work with students and what they've been able to do because of their technology platform and the economies that they've been able to achieve, every single employee is assigned to coach. And that has had an incredible impact. So for the typical tuition reimbursement program that companies have, most companies have, American Express had when I was there, the completion rate of those programs was five to 30%. With Guild, the completion rate is 55 to 80%. Wow. With more in the upper range. On top of that, many of the students in a typical tuition reimbursement program incur debt at 10,000 per year. Hmm. And many of these tuition reimbursement programs are geared to white collar workers. Guild has a diversity of offerings to white collar and blue collar. And what's also very exciting, in addition to the completion rates, students graduating debt free, is that 54% of the participants are people of color, 56% of women, and 76% are people that did not have any college credits at all. So what is exciting about this is this is a model where corporations clearly can better meet the needs of their employees in a cost-effective way. Students can, whether it's high school, college, graduate school, MBA, trade schools can finish the program debt-free. The segments, single women, single mothers working, people of color have increased opportunity because the financial burden is lessened. So this is, a, this is an example, and I think it's happening across technology whether it's healthcare, whether it's education, whether it's parts of online commerce, that fundamental changes can be brought about through technology. Well, yeah. Ken, we could go on, but I'm happy to end on this hopeful and uplifting note. And uh, you mentioned the next chapter. I hope it's gonna be a very long one because I know it's gonna be a very fruitful one. So thank you again today for joining us and I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Marie Jose. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Ken, th thank you so much. And not, not hard to see why you got ahead, I will tell you. Very, very uh, impressive. Uh, and uh, Marie Jose, thank you as well for, uh, for playing a, a, a role that you are accustomed to. Uh, we have uh, some good speakers uh, coming up here in December. Uh, tomorrow, for instance, we've got David Stewart, who is the founder and CEO of Worldwide Technology. Uh, and uh, we also later uh, on the 17th have Mark Carney, uh, the former uh, head of the uh, Bank of England, governor of the Bank of England, uh, who will uh, be uh, 
describing a report, the G30 report on mainstreaming the transition to a net zero economy. That should be quite interesting. Uh, 2021 is shaping up. Uh, we've got uh, Adina Friedman on February 2nd and uh, Chairman Jay Powell, who's confirmed uh, on February 10th. Thank you all for joining.